Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter Six. Discovery. Mr. and Mrs. Shelby, after their protracted discussion of the night before, did not readily sink to repose, and in consequence slept somewhat later than usual the ensuing morning. I wonder what keeps Eliza," said Mrs. Shelby, after giving her bell repeated pulls to no purpose. Mr. Shelby was standing before his dressing glass, sharpening his razor, and just then the door opened and a colored boy entered with his shaving water. Andy said his mistress, "Step to Eliza's door and tell her I have rung for her three times." Poor thing," she added to herself with a sigh. Andy soon returned with eyes very wide in astonishment. "Lor, missus." Lizzie's drawers all open, and her things all lying every which way, and I believe she's done cleared out." The truth flashed upon Mr. Shelby and his wife at the same moment. He exclaimed, "'Then she suspected it, and she's off!' "'The Lord be thanked,' said Mrs. Shelby. "'I trust she is.' "'Wife, you talk like a fool. Really, it will be something pretty awkward for me if she is. Haley saw that I hesitated about selling this child, and he'll think I connived at it to get him out of the way. It touches my honor, and Mr. Shelby left the room hastily. There was great running and ejaculating, and opening and shutting of doors, and appearance of faces in all shades of color in different places, for about a quarter of an hour. One person only, who might have shed some light on the matter, was entirely silent, and that was the head cook, Aunt Chloe. Silently, and with a heavy cloud settled down over her once joyous face, she proceeded making out her breakfast biscuits as if she heard and saw nothing of the excitement around her. Very soon about a dozen young imps were roosting, like so many crows, on the veranda railings, each one determined to be the first one to apprise the strange master of his ill luck. "'He'll be rattle mad, I'll be bound,' said Andy. "'Won't he swar?' said little black Jake. "'Yes, for he does swar,' said woolly-headed Mandy. "'And I hearn him yesterday at dinner. I hearn him all about it.' "'Cause I got it into the closet where Mrs. keeps the great jugs, and I hearn every word." And Mandy, who had never in her life thought of the meaning of a word she had heard more than a black cat, now took airs of superior wisdom, and strutted about forgetting to state that, though actually coiled up among the jugs at the time specified, she had been fast asleep all the time. When, at last, Haley appeared, hooted and spurred, he was saluted with the bad tidings on every hand. The young imps on the veranda were not disappointed in their hope of hearing him swar, which he did with a fluency and fervency which delighted them all amazingly, as they ducked and dodged hither and thither to be out of the reach of his riding whip, and all whooping off together they tumbled in a pile of immeasurable giggle on the withered turf under the veranda, where they kicked up their heels and shouted to their full satisfaction. "'If I had the little devils!' muttered Haley between his teeth. "'But you hain't got them, though,' said Andy, with a triumphant flourish, and making a string of indescribable mouths at the unfortunate trader's back, when he was fairly beyond hearing. "'I say now, Shelby, this year's a most extraordinary business,' said Haley, as he abruptly entered the parlor. "'It seems that gal's off with her young'un.' "'Mr. Haley, Mrs. Shelby is present,' said Mr. Shelby. "'I beg pardon, ma'am,' said Haley, bowing slightly, with a still lowering brow. "'But still I say, as I said before, this year's a singular report. Is it true, sir?' "'Sir,' said Mr. Shelby, "'if you wish to communicate with me, you must observe something of the decorum of a gentleman. Andy, take Mr. Haley's hat and riding-whip. Take a seat, sir. Yes, sir, I regret to say that the young woman, excited by overhearing or having reported to her something of this business, has taken her child in the night, and made off. "'I did expect fair dealing in this matter, I confess,' said Haley. "'Well, sir,' said Mr. Shelby, turning sharply round upon him, "'what am I to understand by that remark? If any man calls my honor in question, I have but one answer for him.' The trader cowered at this, and in a somewhat lower tone said that "'It was plaguy hard on a fellow that had made a fair bargain to be gulled that way. Mr. Haley,' said Mr. Shelby. If I did not think you had some cause for disappointment, I should not have borne from you the rude and unceremonious style of your entrance into my parlour this morning. I say thus much, however, since appearances call for it, that I shall allow of no insinuations cast upon me, as if I were at all partner to any unfairness in this matter. 
Moreover, I shall feel bound to give you every assistance in the use of horses, servants, etc., in the recovery of your property. So, in short, Haley," said he, suddenly dropping from the tone of dignified coolness to his ordinary one of easy frankness, the best way for you is to keep good-natured and eat some breakfast, and we will then see what is to be done. Mrs. Shelby now rose, and said her engagements would prevent her being at the breakfast-table that morning, and deputing a very respectable mulatto woman to attend to the gentleman's coffee at the sideboard, she left the room. "'Old lady don't like your humble servant, over and above,' said Haley, with an uneasy effort to be very familiar. "'I am not accustomed to hear my wife spoken of with such freedom,' said Mr. Shelby dryly. "'Beg pardon. Of course, only a joke, you know,' said Haley, forcing a laugh. "'Some jokes are less agreeable than others,' rejoined Shelby. "'Devilish free, now I've signed those papers, cuss him,' muttered Haley to himself. "'Quite grand since yesterday.' Never did fall of any Prime Minister at court occasion wider surges of sensation than the report of Tom's fate among his compeers on the place. It was the topic in every mouth, everywhere, and nothing was done in the house or in the field but to discuss its probable results. Eliza's flight, an unprecedented event on the place, was also a great accessory in stimulating the general excitement. Black Sam, as he was commonly called, from his being about three shades blacker than any other son of ebony on the place, was revolving the matter profoundly in all its phases and bearings, with a comprehensiveness of vision and a strict lookout to his own personal well-being that would have done credit to any white patriot in Washington. "'It's an ill wind that blow nowhere, that our fact,' said Sam, sententiously giving an additional hoist to his pantaloons and adroitly substituting a long nail in place of a missing suspender-button, with which effort of mechanical genius he seemed highly delighted. "'Yes, it's an ill wind blows nowhere,' he repeated. "'Now, dar, Tom's down, while course there's room for some nigger to be up. And why not this nigger? That's the idea. Tom, riding round the country, boots blacked, pass in his pocket, all grand as cuffy, but who he? Now, why shouldn't Sam? That's what I want to know. Hallo, Sam! Oh, Sam! Masters wants you to coach Bill and Jerry," said Andy, cutting short Sam's soliloquy. "Hi, what's afoot now, young'un? Why, you don't know, I suppose, that Lizzie's cut stick and clared out with her young'un. You teach your granny," said Sam, with infinite contempt. Noted a heap sight sooner than you did. This nigger ain't so green now. Well, anyhow, Massa wants Bill and Jerry geared right up, and you and I's to go with Massa Haley to look out to her. Good now, that's the time o' day," said Sam. It's Sam that's called for in these here times. He's the nigger. See if I don't cotch her now. Massa'll see what Sam can do. Ah, but Sam," said Andy, "you'd better think twice, for Missus don't want her cotched, and she'll be in your wool." Hi," said Sam, opening his eyes. "How you know dat?" Heard her say so, my own self, this blessed morning when I bring in Marcia's shaving water. She sent me to see why Lizzie didn't come to dress her, and when I told her she was off, she just ras up and says she, The Lord be praised! And Marcia, he seemed rail mad, and says he, Wife, you talk like a fool. But, Lord, she'll bring him too. I knows well enough how that'll be. It's allers best to stand Missus side the fence, now I tell you. Black Sam, upon this, scratched his woolly pate which, if it did not contain very profound wisdom, still contained a great deal of a particular species much in demand among politicians of all complexions and countries, and vulgarly denominated, knowing which side the bread is buttered. So, stopping with grave consideration, he again gave a hitch to his pantaloons, which was his regularly organized method of assisting his mental perplexities. "'There ain't no saying, never, about no kind of thing in dis yer world,' he said at last. Sam spoke like a philosopher, emphasizing this as if he had had a large experience in different sorts of worlds, and therefore had come to his conclusions advisedly. Now, certain I'd a said that Missus would a scored the varsal world after Lizzie, added Sam thoughtfully. So she would, said Andy. But can't you see through the ladder, you black nigger? Missus don't want this yer Massa Haley to get Lizzie's boy. That's to go. Hi, said Sam with an indescribable intonation known only to those who have heard it among the negroes. "'I'll tell you more and all,' said Andy. 
I specs you'd better be making tracks for dem horses mighty sudden, too, for I hear Mrs. Quirin arter yer, so you stood foolin' long enough." Sam, upon this, began to bestir himself in real earnest, and after a while appeared bearing down gloriously toward the house, with Bill and Jerry in full canter, and adroitly throwing himself off before they had had any idea of stopping, he brought them up alongside of the horse-post like a tornado. Haley's horse, which was a skittish young colt, winced and bounced, and pulled hard at his halter. "'Ho, ho!' said Sam. "'Skeery, are you?' And his black visage lighted up with a curious mischievous gleam. "'I'll fix you now,' said he. There was a large beech-tree overshadowing the place, and the small, sharp, triangular beech-nuts lay scattered thickly on the ground. With one of these in his fingers, Sam approached the colt, stroked and patted, and seemed apparently busy in soothing his agitation. On pretense of adjusting the saddle, he adroitly slipped under the sharp little nut, in such a manner that the least weight brought upon the saddle would annoy the nervous sensibilities of the animal, without leaving any perceptible graze or wound. Dar, he said, rolling his eyes with an approving grin. "'Me fix em. At this moment Mrs. Shelby appeared on the balcony, beckoning to him. Sam approached with as good a determination to pay court as did ever suit her after a vacant place at St. James or Washington. "'Why have you been loitering so, Sam? I sent Andy to tell you to hurry.' "'Lord bless you, Mrs.' said Sam. "'Horses won't be cotched all in a minute. They done clared out way down to the south pasture, and the Lord knows why. "'Sam, how often must I tell you not to say Lord bless you and the Lord knows and such things? It's wicked.' "'Oh, Lord bless my soul! I done forgot, Mrs. I won't say nothing of the sort no more. Why, Sam, you just have said it again. Did I? Oh, Lord! I mean, I, I didn't go for to say it. You must be careful, Sam. Just let me get my breath, Mrs., and I'll start fair. I'll be very careful. Well, Sam, you are to go with Mr. Haley to show him the road and help him. Be careful to the horses, Sam. You know Jerry was a little lame last week. Don't ride them too fast. Mrs. Shelby spoke the last words with a low voice and strong emphasis. Let this child alone for that, said Sam, rolling up his eye with a volume of meaning. Lord knows! Hi! Didn't I say dat? said he, suddenly catching his breath with a ludicrous flourish of apprehension which made his mistress laugh, spite herself. Yes, Mrs., I'll look out for the horses. Now, Andy, said Sam, returning to his stand under the beech trees, you see, I wouldn't be tall surprised if dat our gentleman critter should give a fling by and by when he comes to be getting up. You know, Andy, critters will do such things. And therewith Sam poked Andy in the side in a highly suggestive manner. Hi, said Andy, with an air of instant appreciation. Yes, you see, Andy, Mrs. wants to make time. Dead ours clare to her most ordinary observer. I just make a little for her. Now, you see, get all these dare horses loose, carpern permiscus, round this yar lot and down to the wood dar. I spec Masserl won't be off in a hurry. Andy grinned. You see, said Sam, you see, Andy, if any such thing should happen as that Master Haley's horse should begin to act contrary and cut up, you and I just let's go iron to help him, and we'll help him, oh yes. And Sam and Andy laid their heads back on their shoulders and broke into a low, immoderate laugh, snapping their fingers and flourishing their heels with exquisite delight. At this instant Haley appeared on the veranda, somewhat mollified by certain cups of very good coffee. He came out smiling and talking in tolerably restored humor. Sam and Andy, clawing for certain fragmentary palm-leaves, which they were in the habit of considering as hats, flew to the horse-posts to be ready to help Masser. Sam's palm-leaf had been ingeniously disentangled from all pretensions to braid, as respects its brim, and the slivers starting apart and standing upright gave it a blazing air of freedom and defiance quite equal to that of any Fiji chief while the whole brim of Andy's being departed bodily, he wrapped the crown on his head with a dexterous thump, and looked about well pleased, as if to say, "'Who says I haven't got a hat?' "'Well, boys,' said Haley, "'look alive now. We must lose no time.' "'Not a bit of him, Masser,' said Sam, putting Haley's rein in his hand, and holding his stirrup, while Andy was untying the other two horses. The instant Haley touched the saddle, the meddlesome creature bounded from the earth with a sudden spring that threw his master sprawling some feet off on the soft dry turf. 
Sam, with frantic ejaculations, made a dive at the reins, but only succeeded in brushing the blazing palm-leaf aforenamed into the horse's eyes, which by no means tended to allay the confusion of his nerves. So, with great vehemence, he overturned Sam, and, giving two or three contemptuous snorts, flourished his heels vigorously in the air, and was soon prancing away towards the lower end of the lawn, followed by Bill and Jerry, whom Andy had not failed to let loose according to contract, speeding them off with various direful ejaculations. And now ensued a miscellaneous scene of confusion. Sam and Andy ran and shouted, dogs barked here and there, and Mike, Mose, Mandy, Fanny, and all the smaller specimens on the place, both male and female, raced, clapped hands, whooped, and shouted with outrageous officiousness and untiring zeal. Haley's horse, which was a white one, and very fleet and spirited, appeared to enter into the spirit of the scene with great gusto, and having for his coursing ground a lawn of nearly half a mile in extent, gently sloping down on every side into indefinite woodland, he appeared to take infinite delight in seeing how near he could allow his pursuers to approach him, and then, when within a hand's breadth, whisk off with a start and a snort, like a mischievous beast as he was, and career far down into some alley of the woodlot. Nothing was further from Sam's mind than to have any one of the troop taken until such season as should seem to him most befitting, and the exertions that he made were certainly most heroic. Like the sword of Coeur de Lion, which always blazed in the front and thickest of the battle, Sam's palm-leaf was to be seen everywhere when there was the least danger that a horse could be caught. There he would bear down full tilt, shouting, "'Now for it! Cotch him! Cotch him!' in a way that would set everything to indiscriminate rout in a moment. Haley ran up and down, and cursed and swore and stamped miscellaneously. Mr. Shelby in vain tried to shout directions from the balcony and Mrs. Shelby, from her chamber window, alternately laughed and wondered, not without some inkling of what lay at the bottom of all this confusion. At last, about twelve o'clock, Sam appeared triumphant, mounted on Jerry, with Haley's horse by his side, reeking with sweat, but with flashing eyes and dilated nostrils, showing that the spirit of freedom had not yet entirely subsided. "'He's cotched!' he exclaimed triumphantly. "'If it hadn't been for me, they might have bust themselves all on em but I cotched em. You, growled Haley, in an no amiable mood, if it hadn't been for you, this never would have happened. Lord bless us, massa, said Sam, in a tone of the deepest concern, and me that has been racing and chasing till the sweat just pours off me. Well, well, said Haley, you've lost me near three hours with your cursed nonsense. Now let's be off, and have no more foolin'. Why, massa, said Sam, in a deprecating tone, I believe you mean to kill us all clar, horses and all. Here we are all just ready to drop down, and, and the critter's all in a reek of sweat. Why, uh, Master won't think of starting on now till our dinner. Master Hoss wants rubbing down. See how he splashed himself? And Jerry limps, too. Don't think Missus would be willing to have a start dis yar way, no how. Lord bless you, Master. We can catch up if we do stop. Lizzie never was no great of a walker. Mrs. Shelby, who greatly to her amusement, had overheard this conversation from the veranda, now resolved to do her part. She came forward, and, courteously expressing her concern for Haley's accident, pressed him to stay to dinner, saying that the cook should bring it on the table immediately. Thus, all things considered, Haley, with rather an equivocal grace, proceeded to the parlour, while Sam, rolling his eyes after him with unutterable meaning, proceeded gravely with the horses to the stable-yard. "'Did you see him, Andy?' "'Did you see him?' said Sam, when he had got fairly beyond the shelter of the barn, and fastened the horse to a post. "'Oh, Lord, if it wasn't as good as a meetin' now, to see him a-dancin' and kickin' and swarin' at us! Didn't I hear him? Swar away, old fellow,' says I to myself. "'Will you have your hoss now, or wait till you cotch him?' says I. "'Lord, Andy, I think I can see him now.' And Sam and Andy leaned up against the barn, and laughed to their hearts' content. "'Your oughter seen how mad he looked when I brought his hoss up. Lord, he'd killed me, if he durst to. And there I was, a standin' as innocent and as humble. "'Lord, I seed you,' said Andy. "'Ain't you an old hoss, Sam?' "'Rather specs I am,' said Sam. "'Did you see Missus upstairs at the winder? I seed her laughin'. "'I'm sure I was racin', so I didn't see nothin,' said Andy. "'Well, you see,' said Sam, proceeding gravely to wash down Haley's pony, I's quired what you may call a habit of observation, Andy. It's a very important habit, Andy, 
and I command you to be cultivating it now you're young. I stepped that hind foot, Andy. You see, Andy, it's observation makes all difference in niggers. Didn't I see which way the wind blew this year morning? Didn't I see what Miss wanted, though she never let on? That ar's observation, Andy. I specs it's what you may call a faculty. Faculties is different in different peoples, but cultivation on 'em goes a great way. I guess if I hadn't helped your observation this morning, you wouldn't have seen your way so smart, said Andy. Andy, said Sam, you's a promising child. There ain't no matter of doubt. I thinks lots of you, Andy, and I don't feel no ways ashamed to take ideas from you. We oughtn't to overlook nobody, Andy, cause the smart of us gets tripped up sometimes. And so, Andy, let's go up to the house now. I'll be bound Miss'll keep us an uncommon good bite this year time. End of chapter 6